Hi, welcome to Developing Spiritual Friendships Workshop. My name is Mikhail and I get to serve as one of the pastors here at the 8th Street Church. This workshop was originally recorded as a Zoom call, so you'll notice that there's opportunity for the people on the call to ask questions. If questions come up for you as you're watching this, I welcome you to email me and I would love to dialogue with you about that. Just so you know, this workshop is kind of presented in four parts. So at first, we'll talk about why um, these kinds of relationships are so challenging for us, why it's hard to, to talk about the real stuff of our spiritual well-being, um, even if people that we know well, and why we need a, a format to help us guide into the kinds of conversations and relationships that we don't know how to create on our own. And then we'll talk about my own, I'll share my own experience of um, a group of friends and um, a format that helped us develop these kinds of long-term spiritual friendship. And then we'll walk through a little bit of that format that we used. And finally, um, talk about what it might look like for you to develop uh, who you can develop these kinds of relationships with and what you are looking for in a person or people to start engaging in a group of this fashion. So uh, I hope that you find this to be encouraging and instructive, and I welcome you back uh, at the end of all of this to receive a blessing as you continue in your process of developing spiritual friendships. So I'm, I'm really grateful for you all joining us. Um, I don't feel like I have anything super profound or complex to share with you, um, but I do have some personal experience that I feel like has been gifted to me that has um, provided such a stable um, foundation and a wellspring for my own spiritual journey. Um, and um, I can look back and, and tell that, uh, especially getting through this pandemic season, I have drawn on um, this and wanted to make sure that I had opportunity to share it with you and whoever else could benefit from it. So uh, one of the reasons I asked for us to share how we got to 8th Street is because um, many of us well, two things. One, I want us to have an uh, opportunity to actually share life together. And that's a small part of our story that feels somewhat safe as an entry point to share life. But secondly, because uh, many of us expressed that we were wanting something um, or were looking for a way to engage in a, a level of relationship or community, um, or even dialogue, maybe conversations that couldn't happen um, in other places of worship or in other relationships. Um, and so one thing that I think is always fascinating about our story of um, becoming 8th Street Church is that in our very earliest days um, that winter was there for, um, we gathered in kind of um, pre pre-worship services. We were just like, you know, figuring things out, getting to know one another, gathering for worship and um, taking turns and jumping in and kind of developing our liturgy and our rhythm and all of that. And mostly, it, um, you know, people came from Bethany First Church. Not everyone came from Bethany First Church. Um, some people hadn't been worshiping um, at a church for a while. But everybody either, you know, I had had conversations with or Chris had had conversations with some of the people that we both knew, but almost to a person, everyone said something to the level of I'm, I'm, I, I want a church where um, it's normal to have relationships with people and um, we can, you know, talk to the people that we are worshiping with and actually get to know them and be good neighbors. I mean, this is where our language came from very early on. And so we started having these, um, these services and realized that no one was talking to each other. Like 
people would walk in the sanctuary. We were meeting at City Press, so first of all, it was a huge space. Um, and people would sit down, not say anything until the music started, stand up and sing, sit back down. Everyone's like, okay, <laughs> then like walk out the doors. And it happened a couple of times. I think it was only like two or three times in before we were like, okay, this is not like, this is not working. Every, every person that we've talked to has said they want a church where they learn how to be good neighbors and they're talking with people and they're friendly. They want a friendly, hospitable community. What is going on here? And through that experience, first of all, developed the good neighbor practice. So we forced people to talk to one another <laughs> in the middle of the service and we've never gotten rid of it. Um, uh, but I also learned, um, which I think probably most people know this, and it just took that experience for me to click in my head, that just because you say you want something does not mean you know how to do it. Just because you are hungry for an experience other than what you've had already doesn't mean that you know how to do the new thing or even if you share that desire with other people, it doesn't mean that you as a, a close group of friends or a new community of people know how to engage in that way together. And so um, what I heard in each of you is a, a shared desire that led you to 8th Street, but also that has led you to this call. And it might not be this, you might not articulate the desire in the same way, but there's a desire for something more or different, deeper um, than, you've, than you've yet experienced. And I first wanna say, I think um, if you don't know how to make that happen, that's okay. That's actually, um, that's kind of how it works. Like we usually, when we say in our responsive reading that we are hungry and thirsty for what we cannot provide ourselves, you know, you, we are longing for something outside of our current experience. So how are we going to know how to make that happen? Um, I think of, you know, some of you that said, I, I have groups of friends, um, but I don't know how to have the kinds of conversations with them that my soul really hungers for. Um, so what I'm going to share with you is my own story and then the resource that, um, that I used in my story um, as an option for you. I'll, I do not think that this um, book is the only way that you can develop spiritual friendships and have you know shared conversation and accountability but i have found that the format um, provides a structure that i needed because i did not know how to make what i wanted i needed that guidance to um, direct the process because i couldn't come up with the process on my own um, and so I, I want to offer that to you before we, before I share about the resource in particular, I just want to, um, give you some of my own story on how I came to this. Um, so when I first moved to Oklahoma city in the summer of 2010, I was hired to be one of the staff pastors at Bethany First Church of the Nazarene. And it was a large, much larger church than any I had been a part of before. Um, it was a much larger staff. I felt in many ways, I knew that this is exactly where God wanted me to be, but in many ways it felt a little bit like being a fish out of water. Um, I had come and I was facing like actual culture shock, um, not just a, a, from Ohio to Oklahoma, but we had lived for a year as volunteer missionaries in Africa, a year in between. And so there was a lot going on in my spirit and mind and body. And so um, I went to a, um, a workshop at a church in Tulsa put on by Renovare, which is a group um, started by Dallas Willard and Richard Foster and some others. 
who are aimed at helping the church in America re-engage in ancient practices for spiritual formation. And I had been introduced to their writing and work some while I was in seminary. And so I received like email lists and I found out about this thing. And so early on in my time in Oklahoma, I mean, I think I was here a couple of months and it felt like I could dip into this old familiar world a little bit. Like, okay, here's this, these speakers and writers and authors and train of thought that I had known in Ohio and um, had, you know, kind of piqued my interest. And now in this new place, maybe I can find other people who are also um, engaged in this and maybe we can, you know, develop relationships around that. Well, that didn't exactly happen the way that I thought it would. Um, I didn't meet anyone from Oklahoma City at that event in Tulsa. Um, but I came away and I felt so impressed that I needed to do something with what I had heard. And I knew that starting out in a new place, in a new ministry, um, everyone knows that I'm I'm extroverted, but I also needed not just people to talk to, like I needed a deeper level of friendship if I was going to sustain this season of life and ministry in this new place. And so I found, I, I received, um, well, I was, I, it was recommended after that conference, like if you're going to start anywhere, start here. And um, so the, the resource um, that I left that place from is this book right here called a spiritual formation workbook, small group resources for nurturing Christian growth. And I'll walk you through a little bit about what that looks like, but I, I walked away from there. It's recommended that you find at least one or two other people to launch into this, um, curriculum with. And, um, I sat on it for I don't know, a couple of months. And every time in prayer, it would like come up to me again. And I kept saying, Lord, I, I legitimately do not know who I would have this level of conversation with. Um, I just moved here. I am not only am I a new person, I'm a new pastor. And my peers, my age, didn't know what to do with me, to be quite honest, because they'd never had um, a pastor who was a woman their age before. And um, there were mostly male pastors on staff with me who were wonderfully supportive and awesome, but did not offer me a sense of, you know, camaraderie or um, close friendship. And so I, I just, every time that prompting of this Holy Spirit would come, I would just kind of just get mad. <laughs> honestly, and be like, I, I want to do that, but I can't do it. I don't think you understand God. This like, I'm in an impossible situation right here where it's, I don't know how that's going to happen. And after a couple of months, um, um, I, I said that again in, in prayer and I, I will never forget. I know where I was sitting in my kitchen table at our house back up on Northwest 106th street. Um, and Rockwell. And um, God is so cute and funny sometimes. The Holy Spirit just said, well, are you going to ask me? Are you, are you going to ask me who, who this should be? Or are you just going to keep telling me why it can't happen? <laughs> I was, I kind of laughed. I mean, I literally was like, oh, <laughs> did not even consider that that was an option. Okay, sure. I'll humor you, God. Who should I meet with on a regular basis to talk about the well-being of my soul? <laughs> and um, I really thought like, I'm going to sit and pray and I'm going to wrestle it out. And I'm going to like, you know, it's going to be months of praying and fasting to receive names. And it's going to be so hard. And in that moment, I just was silent long enough and two names came to mind that I had never considered to be people that I could engage with at this level. But both of them had expressed to me calls, called a ministry um, and were in the process somewhere along the way of their own um, affirmation of call and pursuing of um, credentials 
both were teaching, whether that's in um, one to hot like prayer workshops, another had a Sunday school class in the church. And both, at, when I thought about it, when, a, after the Holy Spirit brought their names to mind, both had expressed to me um, some level of loneliness and desire for deeper connection and didn't ever know how that was gonna happen. And it sounds crazy thinking about it now, but I literally had never connected those dots to think that these women would be people that I could have this kind of conversation with. And so when I reached out to them one at a time, um, I had butterflies. I mean, I was sweaty armpits. I was stomach in knots. It was like, I feel like I do not know you well enough <laughs> to invite you into talking about the nitty gritties of our spiritual journey together. But, but crazy as it may be, I prayed about this and I feel like God brought your name to mind. And I just wonder like all of these long, um, you know, disclaimers. I just wonder if you'd be interested in joining me and, um, you know, we can, we only have to commit to like an eight week process and then see what we want to go after there. Each of them jumped on it faster and more eagerly than I ever could have imagined. And they were like, yes, I cannot tell you how long I have wanted something like this. I need this in my life. I would love to be a part of it. And then I was like, well, I've already asked this. I've also simultaneously asked this other person and I need to know what you think about them. And I didn't even know that they knew each other. And um, God simultaneously orchestrated a really cool full circle event in their lives um, that had begun 15 years earlier. So all of that to say, um, that led that that was the starting point of us walking through this material that I'm going to share with you together. We did start as I think it's an eight or nine week process where you go through the whole curriculum together. And then, you know, they give you a way to continue if you choose to continue meeting on a regular basis. Well, we met um, every single week also most of the time, this was before I had children. <laughs> um, we met every single week for an hour and then it could kind of go longer than that sometimes because um, we got to be talking uh, for uh, about five years. And when Andrea Mosshart came back from Swaziland and also joined staff at Bethany First Church, um, we Felt, each of us felt individually that the spirit lead us to invite her into that as well. So for the last two years, um, there were four of us that met regularly. So um, what ended up happening in that relationship far outgrew the confines of this curriculum that I'm going to share with you tonight. But I guarantee you, had we just started meeting and kind of done things loosey-goosey, you know, don't really have an agenda. We're not gonna stick to a format. We're just gonna get together and see what happens. We would not have met for five years. We would not have been prayer and fasting partners for each other during incredibly difficult decisions, marital crisis, miscarriages, children's births, planting a new church, um, we, we, we wouldn't have weathered any of that. It was because we started with a, it's almost like a, a trellis that the vine needs to have something to grow on. And once you give it that little bit of direction, it can go wild. It can flourish, but without something to kind of shape that growth, it's, it's not going to do much. It's just going to, you know, wind around on the ground everywhere and trip you up. So um, as I lead us through just kind of an overview of what this book provides and this curriculum is, I don't want you to think that we spent five years just doing this every single week. This trained us for the kinds of conversation 
that we would need to sustain our friendships and our ministry, um, our life together in our families, the decisions that we needed to make, it sustained us through all of that. And we're no longer meeting um, regularly, but we are still a group that, you know, we have a Marco Polo group, we have a text group, we are each other's um, prayer warriors and, and feedback. Um, but it's um, also felt like a place of um, preparation for the way the Holy Spirit would send us into various quarters, um, which happened about five years ago with me planting a church and some others. One was a missionary for a while. So, um, so that is my own personal experience. Um, and I have found that it's invaluable for me to have at least one place where not only can I feel safe that what I say isn't going to go anywhere else, but that I actually can say some of the, not, not like bad things, but actually say some of the, the things that I'm afraid to say out loud because they're so good. The things that I hope for and dream of and the things that I I don't know, it might be the Holy Spirit leading me to do, but I might also be crazy. I don't know. I just need a place to just say it out loud and see what happens. And, and trust that the people on the other end both love me and know how and, and, and care about my well-being more than they care about me being happy with them in the moment. So that they can say, mm, I think you better think about that a different way, Mikhail. Or, you know, that might feel like that's where things are going, but I want to remind you of what you shared with us three months ago. Um, it's that kind of holding up of a mirror that is um, such a tremendous gift. So um, those kinds of things, the things that we need the most, um, we really don't know how to create. Um, and we also can't make them happen quickly. It takes time to grow that level of trust. It also takes time to develop um, the, really the understanding to know what all these friendships can and should provide for us. Um, so there's a lot of patience required in that. But before we go step, we're not gonna take a long time, but just kind of an overview of what this curriculum looks like. I wanna um, open it up and see if any of you have questions about any of the details of my own experience or what my experience brings to mind in your own experience and what questions for clarity or next steps um, you might have right now. Okay, either I am such a clear communicator that no one has any questions about what I said, or <laughs> um, everyone has so many questions that they don't even know how to articulate any of them. Um, and I would love the first one, but even the second one is totally valid. So um, I want to make sure that you leave this hour and five, 10 minutes together, um, feeling like you have what you need to take the next right step. Um, so just we'll continue on going through the, um, the book format, but if there are things that pop up and you're like, I really need clarification on that. Um, or I really want to know how this would play out, then please don't hesitate to, to jump in on that, okay? So I want to show you, um, um, I, I have my book right here. <laughs> I still, I, it's like pages are yellowed and all kinds of pencil underlinings. Um, but <laughs> the first page talks about, um, starting a group and really what this is um what this is all about 
Um, so it, it asks um, pretty simple questions that I think are really helpful. Like, how does a spiritual formation group actually work and how is it different than any other kind of group? Now this it does call it spiritual formation, um, a spiritual formation group, which you can totally call it. I realized that for me, what it grew into was, was spiritual friendships. Um, so, you know, call it whatever you will. But they define it as two to seven people. Personally, I think four is plenty. Um, going beyond that gets real hard, but they say two to seven. Uh, gathering regularly to study, share past experiences, and make plans for the week ahead. This is done easily by following a suggested order of meeting. During each gathering, which should last between 60 and 90 minutes, one person is designated as that, as that week's leader and that person rotates so that um, not everyone, not one person feels responsible the whole time. He or she guides the group through a series of opening words, question and answer session, and the closing time of prayer. And all of that is provided in the in the book and there's kind of like we do our responsive reading at church there's places for the leader to read and there's places um, for each for everybody to read together and then people to take turns reading um, but within this flexible format members are reminded of their task they are enabled to hear from one another and empowered to share plan and dream with each other and it is within the, this framework that the balance, the knowledge, and the encouragement and accountability are nurtured. So if you think about our um, responsive reading that we say every week in worship, we gather here to tell the truth that our lot, we don't have our lives together on our own. We can't get them together. We need God's grace and we need each other. Um, that statement reminds us every single week of our shared purpose, our shared identity, and our shared desire and our shared um, commitment to, to living out that desire. We will be good neighbors. We will have real conversations with one another and real relationships. Um, uh, this works as kind of a microcosm of that. Every week or how often you gather, every two weeks, whatever, there's a process of remembering and stating together why you are gathering and what you're there for. So this could exist within friendships that you already have other kinds of conversation with. But when you gather for this particular um, meeting, the conversation is, uh, is gonna be on topic. It's gonna be this. Um, so uh, that's, one of those, that's one of the framework pieces that provides safety. Um, let me pause there. Can everyone hear me and see me okay? Someone just sent me a message that it looked like my like my connection was cutting out. Is it better now? Okay, great. Thank you for letting me know that. Um, so the way that this um, book works, um, it offers, let me get to the page. It offers eight beginning sessions where everything is spelled out really simply um, and gives guidance about how that hour long meeting will go. And so the, the first eight weeks is really about um, journeying through the different um, streams of spiritual formation. Um, practice and life. So um, it's discovering a balanced vision of Christian faith and practice. It's not necessarily teaching a, um, a theology or a perspective, but it's teaching about the wide, long, rich history of Christian tradition and practice. So the practices that it highlights then one week after another are the prayer fill, practicing the prayer filled life, practicing the virtuous life, practicing, um, well, let me, the prayer filled life is about the contemplative tradition. Virtuous life is about the holiness tradition. The spirit empowered life is about the charismatic tradition. 
the compassionate life is about the social justice tradition, and the word-centered life is about the evangelical tradition, and then finally the sacramental life is coming to this from the incarnational tradition. So um, each of these commonly can be kind of pitted against one another or seen as polar, you know, you're like moving from contemplative to charismatic and there's somewhere in between, um, or that you are evangel evangelical or social justice and, you know, there's two sides of the tension. Um, Renovari, shows this actually as a wheel and they are spokes that make up a full wheel of experience together. Oh, this is funny. So in one of your first sessions, you kind of talk about these, um, all of these eight traditions and where you are in your own growth and balance of each of them. And then throughout the whole course of the curriculum, you're, you're, digging into them a little bit deeper to grow and to balance your the rounding out of your full spiritual experience. So this is how I answered this, I don't know, 10 years ago, I guess, almost. But it has this opening kind of practice to, um, to get you engaged in kind of that introspection and so all of this is done in conversation with each other. You're not um, judging one another. You're not um, grading one another, but you are having that time and space for inward reflection that each person is doing that same work. And um, then you're sharing it with one another. So um, then at the end of those eight weeks, it, oh, I should say this also, um, which will sound very familiar to you all. Um, but within each week, there's then a list of suggested practices um, to kind of nurture your development of that area. And then when you meet the next time, one of the things that you talk about is your experience of the previous practice. So there's some built-in accountability. You're each taking on a practice. Um, and then you have conversation about what that practice was like, or if honestly it didn't happen. Um, so again, I just experienced that this level of um, structure was so necessary for the, I, I was, I felt safe enough for, for my new friends to ask me questions and I was voluntarily submitting myself to accountability with them because they were shared practices that we were taking on together. And I think that's one of the most important aspects of um, accountability is that it is actually mutual. It becomes very harmful um, and, and it ceases to be accountability when it is not mutual. It becomes a performance review. And I think a lot of times that has been our connotation or even maybe our experience of um, accountability relationships. Um, but what I wanna suggest is that this is a format for um, each person providing the same exact care, accountability and nurture for one another. And then as you progress through the eight weeks, you can discern whether or not this is something that you want to keep doing long term. And it gives you guidance for how to prayerfully discern next steps. If there's a change that needs to be made, um, if there's someone else that needs to be added. Um, and, and the whole thing kind of carries, um, you. it doesn't feel like you're, you know, going to disappoint anyone if you go in together and start praying about it and somebody says, you know, I felt like it's time for me to do something different. There's a format in place for the discernment process and the whole thing like undergirds the, the, the spiritual nature of those relationships so that, you know, people aren't going to be, I mean, you can't, 
ever make promises, but that people aren't going to like leave in a huff or say, you know, they were personally offended. So they're leaving the group. Um, the, the goal is that the group would exist for the mutual purpose of each other's spiritual growth and well-being. And then from there, you decide if that's working and if that's something that the Holy Spirit is still calling you to. So that's a little bit of an overview of this particular um, resource, which I highly, highly recommend. Um, and then I want to make sure that we have time for some like pretty logistic next step stuff about how you would actually, if you choose to do this resource in particular, how would you actually get a group going? But before we get to the logistics, I want to check in again and see um, if we have any questions about the curriculum itself, whether that's my experience of it or, um, you know, the writing or anything else. I'm curious to what was your um, format after the eight weeks? Is it, did you kind of follow along the same lines kind of with that, it seemed pretty structured um, format or did you kind of guess, you know, how the group wanted to continue and make, was it the same structure or less structure after you completed that curriculum? That's a good question. I would say we stayed um, pretty good on the same amount of structure for a couple of years. After that, it kind of waned and we do like a um, and every six month or annual like check in and grade ourselves and like get back on track, you know, and then we would kind of go back it it be it it kind of morphed into um, a I mean, it was it was always a prayer group, but it kind of morphed into like a weekly check in accountability prayer once we and then we would have seasons where we would be a little bit more structured. It does provide a really great structure. And this is what we went off of first. It provides a detailed structure of an order of meeting past when the curriculum, the eight weeks is finished. So it has opening words that kind of serve as the, the gather, the call to worship that says, this is why we're here. Um, there's a covenant that you read together that stays through all the way through all of the, um, the eight weeks and beyond. Um, you read common disciplines together that come from the eight streams or the eight traditions of Christian faith. And then it has um, questions of examine that are kind of the accountability questions. And there's one from each um, stream. And so it encourages you to kind of rotate through or have each person um, ask a question that feels like what they need to talk about. So it, for example, some of these questions are, um, in what ways has God made his presence known to you since our last meeting? Um, what temptations have you faced since our last meeting and how did you respond? Have you sensed any influence or work of the Holy Spirit since we last met? What spiritual gifts has the Spirit enabled you to exercise? What opportunities has God given you to serve others since our last meeting and how did you respond? Um, in what ways have you encountered Christ as you read scriptures and has God provided an opportunity for you to share your faith with someone since our last meeting? In what ways have you been able to manifest the presence of God through your daily work since our last meeting? How has God fed and strengthened you through the ministry of word and sacrament? So those, um, those are kind of a snapshot of what the ongoing conversation questions look like. Um, and then from there, you can, you can spend as long as you need or as little as you need, and you can create your own as well. Every week when you meet together after the eight sessions, there's a whole um, long list of multiple practices in each of the tradition that you say, what would you like to work on specifically this week? Pick a practice, name it. Um, for those of us who are regularly a part of 8th Street Church, that might just be a, a commitment to our congregation, weekly practice and conversation about that specific one. 
Um, and then it closes with um, the Lord's Prayer together and closing words. So we operated with that structure uh, for most of the time that we met after those eight weeks. And then even our non-structured meetings still carried a lot of that same, um, certainly carried that same intentionality. And we almost always chose at least one of the questions listed to all answer and talk about and guide our conversation together. It's a good question. Any others? I have a question. Did you, um, while reading or walking through the curriculum, did you feel like the, um, like it was written for people that were in different places in their spiritual journey? Do you know what I'm trying to say? Like, um, because sometimes some spiritual formation books can feel a little daunting to people that maybe have just started in their mm -hmm. faith. And so I'm, as I'm just thinking through, like, I mean, would you, I don't know. I just, I, I think about I, it. I may not be the best judge, but I do feel like it's pretty accessible. Um, mostly because it describes each of the eight traditions as if you don't know anything about them. And most of us come from, if we've spent any time in church at all, we at least come strong in with one of those eight traditions. Um, I think what is equal, what I think one of the gifts of this is that it does level the playing field so that we can each be learners in a new area. Even if someone is really strong in the contemplative tradition, someone else is really strong in the social justice tradition or the evangelical or the holiness, whatever. And, and there's um, a shared humility, but there's also like a swap of expertise. And I think the other thing that's really helpful for it being accessible is that um, even in the first like week when you draw your circle around um, your own strength and growth areas. Um, there's room there to, um, to admit what you don't know. And um, everybody can participate in that pretty equally, I think. Does that help? Now, this is not a great format for someone who doesn't really have a faith experience because <laughs> it kind of presupposes that. Um, I think it could be accessible to someone who has a, um, a spiritual desire, even if they don't have a lot of um, church experience, but it's not really, um, you know, it's not like it, I don't think it can be easily adapted for an interfaith conversation. I think it's pretty much just straight Christian <laughs> all the way through. Any others? Okay, so our last few minutes together, um, I want to encourage you, as you've kind of been exposed to this, you've heard my story, um, I, I want to invite you to think through kind of your imaginary Rolodex of relationships that you have and see if there's one person that you can name that for different reasons um, might be the, the person the next conversation about this I'll give you some um, some ideas um, it doesn't have to be a person that you've known for a long time um, it doesn't have to be a person that's the same age as you unless you are a married couple also meeting with another married couple I would I would personally recommend that it's your same gender. But other than that, um, I think, you know, 
we limit ourselves too much when we when we think about a narrow like person that's in my same um, career field or age group or race or um, you know um, walk of life whatever um, I, some of the richest experiences in conversation with me in this group and in other experiences have been because of different experiences that we bring. Uh, I am enriched when I hear um, the, the experiences and the wisdom that come from someone who has had a very different life from mine or who is at a very different stage of life than I am. So I think what I encourage you to listen for, to look for, is someone that you respect. That's important. Um, and someone that you feel um, an, an equality with. Uh, someone you can look up to this person and respect them and admire them, but um, if you feel like you're gonna, if you feel insecure around this person, or if you feel like somehow you have to perform for this person, they are not the ones. Uh, this needs to be a person that you feel safe with. Maybe not same, um, maybe not, um, um, you know, being challenged is not the same thing as unsafe, right? <laughs> so maybe it's a person that constantly challenges you um, and but you don't ever question your worth <laughs> um, in their presence and you don't wonder if they are really a safe person for you. I say that because I think sometimes we can um, have idealized pictures of what a relationship should be. Um, and this is a really important point of discernment of what a relationship is currently. And start from a relationship that we all have relationships that we want to be different than they are. Um, but you have to at least start this kind of conversation with people who, at least it's at a good, it's at a, a good place now. You want to take it deeper, but you know the the foundation doesn't need to shift or change. Hi, Grace. <laughs> um, so I think the the two most important things are safety, which is in with equality, and shared desire. Maybe it's not someone that has more experience in this particular thing than you do. Um, but at least has uh, the same, the desire pointed in the same direction, if that makes sense. So if no one comes to mind, um, then, you know, I think let my experience speak for all of us and ask the Holy Spirit to provide a name. Um, it might be a couple of names. Um, and then if all else fails and you've prayed on it for a week or two and you're like, nothing is happening, I welcome you to come he to me. Um, and, and, you know, I've also prayed in anticipation and that there may be others in our congregation who are hungering for something, but especially in this time of COVID, literally don't even know each other's names in order for the Holy Spirit to tell each other their names. <laughs> and I'm open to helping um, connect as needed. And I will commit to being a prayerful um, person, not a hodgepodge or matchmaking person for that endeavor. The final thing on that is particularly to those who are here at 8th Street with us. Um, you know, we do have parish groups that um, many of our parish groups are only meeting once a month. Some are continuing to meet um, every other week. But irregardless, um, being in a large group, wearing masks and or outdoors and or Zoom, you may hear some screaming in the background. Sorry. Um, Galilee is alive and well. 
let's not forget. Um, but anyway, um, this is an opportunity, I think, hopefully, for you to um, maybe engage with even people that are already within your parish group at a deeper level and outside of parish group time um, that you, you already have some relationship going, but especially during this next stretch that you're not going to go to that level in that group. Um, now for others, maybe that would not be the safest, wisest choice, but I think that's one of the options that, um, that I can see for us. So I think the biggest thing for that is that if that, if, if, smaller groups meet within parish group. Um, I think it would just be, uh, you know, clear and obvious that it's not a subdivision or a click, um, but that it's a prayerful commitment to one another um, and, and that you can invite people into that experience with you. So those are my, um, kind of my thoughts or caveats on, on that. Any other questions on this last little piece of logistics? I have a quick question about logistical stuff. Do you think it is important that it be every week or is it like, is the every weakness important or is it able to be done every other, you know, I, yeah. I don't think the every single week is that important. Um, you know, I have a group that's going to start meeting in this format um, of other women clergy from a handful of women clergy from around the nation. And they've opted for a, a one hour weekly gathering on Zoom um, just because that's the best way for it to stay in their schedule, in our schedule. Um, but I think you could you could adapt it and have it be every other, every two weeks. I think the most, I think consistency is key. I don't think it has to be every single week, um, but the consistency is really important. And if you don't meet every week, I think a check-in um, would be helpful. Um, and then, you know, you have two weeks to do the practice and then report back on it. So if you do it that way, you just know that instead of an eight week commitment, you're making an initial 16 week commitment. Yeah. Any others? I'm just gonna say, I did a thing like this at my old church called Apprentice that was two years. And the thing that was the coolest about it was it wasn't stratified by like, moms who are married or whatever it was a total slew of people and that was really really mm -hmm. really cool to be with young single people and much older grandmas I learned so much from it being that way like it wasn't people I would have picked as friends necessarily right but it made it really awesome right um this book is a precursor to apprentice did you notice who the author is? Yeah. So James Bryan Smith um, wrote the three books of Apprentice, Good and Beautiful God, Good and Beautiful Life, and Good and Beautiful Community, which some of us have done in spiritual formation retreat as well. So for those who are retreat alums at um, 8th Street, a lot of this will feel like a continuation of what we did there. So as I said at the beginning, I welcome your questions, or if you'd like to set up a time to have more dialogue on this, that would be great too. You can email me at any time. And like I offered those on the Zoom call, I also want to offer you, if I can be of any help in connecting you with a person or a group of people that um, can offer you this spiritual friendship that we've been talking about, I would love to help in any way that I can. Now, as we leave this virtual time and space together, I want to offer you this benediction. So please receive these words of blessing. 
Friends, may you know and be very aware that the Spirit of God is present within you and around you. And may this Spirit of God guide you into all freedom and joy and belonging and growth as this Spirit leads you to develop friendships among others who need the very same thing. Go in grace and in peace. God bless you.